let us all here, young and old, be like Anna and Simeon, nurtured in the place of prayer, looking to the world of the signs of God's presence, held together by his, this beloved truth. We turn together to worship the one who calls us all in prayer and practice towards the works of love. Amen. Good morning to you all, brothers and sisters. Today is our first Sunday after Christmas. We want to thank God for what God has done to us, sending us his own son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, as John 3, verse 16 says. So I'm saying to you, I hope you have really enjoyed your Christmas. Uh, you had a wonderful time with your friends, family members. And uh, as you, we continue to hear the word of God, we just give praise and honor and glory to God. Let us pray. Father, as Mary and Joseph went on the pilgrimage of faith in Jerusalem, so we too have come on a pilgrimage of faith today to this place of worship. Meet us, O oh God, as we gather and open our eyes to see the eternal truth all around us, calling us into love and more love and things that are everlasting. Thank you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. I would call Brother Ben to come and do the reading from the book of Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 14. Thank you, Brother. Morning, everyone, and what a, a great few days it's been over Christmas and just remembering the, the birth of our Lord. It's just been fantastic and been able to share time with our family and whatnot. So, yeah, I hope you had a good time too. Um, as Johnson mentioned, I'll be reading from Luke 2, uh, 21 to 40. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Lord every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and ma mother marvelled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Peniel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow again. She was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they turned to they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. 
He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. And this is the word of the Lord. And uh, we'll get Johnson back to share what he has for us today. Thanks, Johnson. Thank you, Brother Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. I've come up with a theme today. They also save who wait. They also save who wait. Simeon and Anna were also aging Jews who clung to their hope and waited. Luke tells us that Simeon and Anna lived in Jerusalem and were among those who looked expectantly for God to come in power to save his people. Who believes that a God who can save will not leave the synagogue forever empty? Simeon and Anna believe that a God who can save would not leave the chosen people forever empty. And so they did what they could, and they waited. The New Testament scholar Raymond Brown gives us the best translation of Luke's description of them. Simon was upright and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Anna never left the temple because day and night she worshipped God and fasting and praying for she was among those waiting for the redemption of Israel. It is never easy to wait for anything of importance. For Christmas, for the place plain carrying the one who loves, for the morning to relieve the sleepless night, for the healing world in a bitter argument, for the toilsome task to be done, for the labor to be over and the child to be born. For death, it is never easy to wait. Waiting is always difficult. It is hardest of all to wait for God. Not man could bear his harsh discipline. Not man can attain his de delicate balance of action and hope. Not man can achieve his deep wisdom. Not man can endure its long and dark hours. Therefore, since the demands of waiting for God are so great, there is always the temptation to transform waiting for God into something else, something less. Whenever we are waiting and waiting takes long, people end up doing something. I've heard and seen people who have been waiting, maybe for their partners who have gone maybe abroad we have gone somewhere doing mission work or whatever and these partners end up engaged in other relationships because they could not wait any longer so waiting always brings at the end some different um, dimensions there are some who could change waiting for God into passivity it is God for whom we wait they say so nothing can be done until God comes Nation will rage against nation and there is nothing we can do about it. We must wait for God to bring us peace. The poor will always have with us and it is God who will take care of them. We will live in an evil and unjust world, sad but true. And we must wait for God to set things right. But waiting for God is not like sitting in a darkened theater. Idly waiting for the move to begin. Waiting for God is more like waiting for an honored guest to arrive at our home. What do we do when we hear that maybe the president, the prime minister of the country is coming to visit you? What kind of waiting will it be like? There's much work to be done. Everything must be made ready. Every sweep of the broom, every pressing of the door, Every setting of the table is done in anticipation of the needs and wishes of those who are to come. Because we have heard that the Prime Minister is going to visit you. You make everything to look very good from the outside, from the garden. You even look at your neighbor's places to say, do they know who is coming? Why are, is their place, their garden like that? You, you, you seem like you should have told them to say, please guys, can you make up your garden? Because I've got an important visitor coming who is the Prime Minister of the country. King, Martin Luther King knew that complete justice must wait 
Await the coming of God. That was the theme of his final sermon in which he proclaimed. I've been to the mountain top. I've seen the promised land. But he was persuaded that while we wait, the time is always ripe to do the right thing. Simon and Anna were waiting for God to come. But they also were not passive in their waiting. Simon was full of devotion and did what was just. Anna kept the lights burning at the temple with a ceaseless worship. They waited. While they waited, they did what they could. On the other hand, there are those who are weary of waiting for God, who would turn instead to more immediate and tangible sources for action and hope. And a weary story, but also a parable of often judged expectations of those who wait for God. Someone cries, peace, peace, but there's no peace. Another says, comfort, comfort, but there's little comfort. Come thou long expected, goes the prayer for him, and he has turned in moment of curious interest, then seeing nothing, going back to work. And so, weary of waiting on a God who does not come, we lower our horizons, fold our hands in prayer to more tangible goods to give us purpose and to turn to more immediate and reliable sources for hope. This always happens. We turn to more tangible things. That's why I find that when Moses went up the mountain and it could not turn back in a short time, Aaron and others came up with an idea of coming up with a golden calf. Because waiting is always difficult. We build shiny sanctuaries of glass and steel where we can celebrate possible thinking. And the other human potentials which we hope we save us from our self-doubt, if not ours. We fill soil silos and skies with ever more potent weapons of destruction, which we hope will save us from each other. And we summon the exiles of modern medicine to save us from disease, aging and finally from death. In short, tired of waiting for the true God, we create our own. Right now, the people because they are waiting for a lot of things, go on the internet. There are a lot of things that can make you also now to become even young. A lot of tablets, a lot of anything that they think will make you look young is because they are tired of waiting. And people think it's better for me to do certain things. In Arnold Schulzbeck opera, Moses and Aaron while Moses was on the mountain receiving the law Aaron, law Aaron is left with the valley to wait for the people. Exhausted, impatient, and deprived of the vision of what is present, the people cry to Aaron, point out to God, we want to kneel down. But then where is he? Point him out. Finally, Aaron yields to their plea, forging for them a God they can touch. A God of whom they never have to wait. O Israel, he says, I return your gods to you and also give you to them. Just as you have demanded, you shall provide the stuff, I shall give it a form. Can you see this imagery? It teaches us about people cannot wait. But our gods made of positive thoughts, nuclear thoughts, neg negation, management objectives, secular therapies, Cosmetic skill cannot save us. All these gods cannot save us. Indeed, they can become burdens to us, heavy to carry, cost to maintain. It is God alone who saves. And part of what it means to be fully human is to wait for his coming. To wait for his coming. Jesuit priest William F. Flunch has observed that there are two kinds of waiting. One kind waits because there is nothing else to do. The other is born out of hope. The decision to engage in the hopeful kind of waiting is one of the greatest human acts. It includes surely the acceptance of darkness, sometimes deficiency. It includes the enlarging 
of one's perspective beyond the present moment. He simply chooses to wait, and in so doing, gives the future the only chance it has to emerge. Simeon and Anna did not wait because there was nothing else to do. No, they didn't wait because there was nothing else to do. But because they had hope. Therefore, their waiting was not a vacuum devoid of activity. They waited and worshipped, performed acts of justice and prayer. While they waited, they defied the darkness by serving God. Because it was for the light of God that they waited. They did what they do, and they waited. So they continued to do all their business while he's waiting. And Luke tells us, God did come to them. Who knows what they were expecting? But surely it was not this. A fragile baby bundled into the table by two young parents who were eager to obey the ritual law of purification. But who are too poor to afford the sacrifice of a lamb and brought them with instead the acceptable substitute, a pair of beds? A man, a woman, two beds, and a baby. Can this be the herald that they hoped coming for of God? Is this what they've been waiting for? It is hard to wait for God. There are some who wait for God passively, and there are some who impatiently refuse to wait. But the hardest pair, part of waiting for God is to recognize and accept God when he comes and how he comes. When God comes, are you able to see that this is God? And are we able to understand who God is? We pray for God to come and give us young people to fill the pews and God comes not bringing more people but a new and demanding mission. We pray for God to give us inner peace and God comes to us bring another struggle. Think about those things. We pray for God to come and heal and God comes to us at gravesite saying, I am the resurrection and life. We pray for God to come and console his people in front of the door of the temple, walk to you, and uncertain parents getting a pair of beds and a babe who will die on the cross. Is that what they were waiting for? But old Anna looked and somehow knew that she had seen the fulfillment of her hope and Israel's hope. Old Simeon looked and he knew too, he knew that God indeed had come. And he also knew that this coming of God, like all of God's coming, both met human need and defiled human expectation. That it would bring both salvation and demand great hope and great cost. As soon as he said, Simon said, My eyes have seen their salvation, he added the warning. This child is set for the fall and rising of men in Israel. Every coming of God meets our needs, but also violates our expectation and demands in our lives. So redemption and sacrifice, hope and demand, so it is with the coming of God, but God will come. The God who came to Simeon and Anna will come to us too, violating our expectations, even as he comes to meet our deepest needs. Until he comes, like Anna and Simeon, we do wait and do what we can do while we are waiting. We should continue to do what we can do while we are waiting. We know that our Lord is coming. We don't know the date and the time, but our Lord will be coming. So while we are waiting, we continue to do what we should be doing in our waiting. We don't need to stop anything. We don't need to stop doing what we are supposed to be doing. We should continue doing what we should be doing while we are waiting. So brothers and sisters, I'm just saying, urging you to wait patiently. Not wait patiently, wait actively. Not only that, but to participate in building the kingdom of God while you are waiting. Nothing should be stopped because we have said our God is coming. We should continue to do whatever we are doing. We should continue to do everything that builds the world 
while we are waiting for our, the coming of the Lord, we know the Lord is coming. It's not very far. Our Lord is coming very soon. We don't know it. You may say, Johnson, you are, you are just made, making speculations, but that is what the Bible says. Our Lord is coming. We don't know the time. We don't know the day. But our God is coming. So it is in waiting, while we are doing all these activities, that our God will come. May the God help us as we continue to worship him, as we continue to serve him, as we continue to go out with our different activities, knowing that God can come at any time. You never know where God will come, what you will we'll be doing. Where will you be when God comes? God bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Okay. Let us pray. <clears throat> Today we honor Simeon and Anna. Old both, they had a light that sustained them. They both held strongly to what they knew they hoped for. May we, people of all ages, be held together by what sustains us. Whether seven or seventy, may we know what is most important. Today we honor all shapes of families, families of adoption, families by birth, families in grief, families in multiple homes, families in negotiation, families in care, families in support. In all shapes of family, may we find ways of love and kindness. Today we pray for people who are ignored because of their age, people who are elderly. Maybe we thought they, don't, they lack wisdom, they lack the future passion. In an era where young youth and beauty are praised, we have so often ignored wisdom and experience, long-standing fullness of perspective. For all we have felt overlooked, for all we have love and wisdom to share, we pray, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. I'm going to ask you to take your offering. And um, you try to use all methods you can use. But I hope the most one, easiest one could be the electronic one where you can deposit your money from your computers or from your gadgets into the church account and the account will be given to you uh, below. Let us pray. Father, we bring our offering to you. Bless our offering. You have given us everything and we remember that Christmas is the time of giving because you gave us your son Jesus Christ, to die for us, who is the Lord of everything, who is the master of life. Father, we bring our offering as a way of remembering what you have done, because we have been reminded that Christmas is a time of giving and sharing. So we we'll continue to bring our offerings to you. Thank you. Bless our offering, Father so that they can be used for the expansion of your kingdom. Amen. Let us receive grace. Lord, your faithful servants, Anna and Simon, it's dreams and visions that sustain them into their old age, enrich us with all visions and dreams that sustain us from one decade to the next, so that your eyes might always be bright with the life that we will see all around. Send us out today in all days with love in this vocation. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.